All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the April 15th, 2024 <coughs> Grants Pass City Council Workshop. Uh, first thing today, we're going to be hearing from some of our community partners, and I think uh, Dana Pierce, our Economic Development Director, is here to introduce them. Get us started. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Dana Pierce, Economic Development Manager for the City of Grants Pass. I'm just introducing our um, community partners today for economic development. Uh, we contract with each of these, um, in these organizations um, each year to provide economic development support. And um, I'm gonna start with Colleen Padilla. She's our, um, the Executive Director for Southern Oregon Regional Economic Development Incorporated, also known as So Ready. And um, yeah, we'll go back to the beginning here. Let's see. Um. Okay, I think we're ready. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor Bristol and Councilors. Um, thank you for having us today. I'm Colleen Padilla, and thank you to our partners. They help us figure out technology all the time. So, um, Dana, my next question is, where do I have my... Do I have a click? Okay, thank you for your patience. Uh, counselors, you have in front of you our uh, three-year report, which you may not have seen before. Uh, you may have Mayor Bristol. Um, and, and a lot of this is referenced that I'm gonna go through. Um, but for all of us, um, what I just wanted to give you an update today is what we've been doing primarily over the last three years where it seems maybe we've been a little bit more quiet than usual, but we certainly have not been. We've been rather busy. This is about our One Rogue Valley strategy. It's one roadmap five key initiatives, which you can see are business development and talent, tourism, placemaking, and also innovation and entrepreneurship. All 15 jurisdictions are involved in our service territory. And in that strategy, there are over 130 different metrics. In that period of reporting, which is July 1, 2020 through June 2023, uh, we wrote 27 unique support letters, which included many different initiatives from municipalities to our libraries, to tourism venues, educational endeavors, airport expansions, many, many things that are related to economic development. <coughs> One of the things that we've done before, which you should be familiar with, is we are the Enterprise Zone Manager by resolution. Your enterprise zones go back to 1997 and 1999. In this reporting period, uh, there were 19 authorizations uh, that we worked with in our entire region. This is both for Jackson and Josephine County. Those authorizations were the equivalent of $30.6 million in wage impact, 128, excuse me, $120.8 million in new capital investments 
and you can see that rounds up to about $151.5 million. Enterprise zone is not for everyone. It is for primary job creators, manufacturers, technology companies, and in our region, you as the sponsors also allow hotel development. I will say, uh, before I talk on this slide, currently we just finished up kind of the annual filing process. I'm gonna go back to that slide. Annual filing process for the Enterprise Zone, which we provide complimentary business services to all the Enterprise Zone applications. And it's their time of the year by April 1st when they submit their property schedules and claims to the assessor's office. We have 32 open authorizations, so it takes a lot of hand-holding and getting things done, and that's what's uh, been going on the last few weeks. So this next slide uh, is based on 2021 data from the Oregon Employment Depart Department. This really gives you an idea of why it's important to see not only your community, but the entire region as part of your economic development system. 19.8% of the workforce in Josephine County actually has a primary job that's in Jackson County. And you can see the number there, about 6,000 people. And then 6.1% of the workforce in Jackson County actually has their job in Josephine County. And I may have shared this with you before, but this may explain why there's a lot of traffic on the freeway in the morning and in the evening. The state of Oregon is also pretty high in exporting firms. This gives you a little bit more data about Jackson County and Josephine County. In Josephine County, 78 exporting firms with 50.9 million in exports. These are the companies that typically provide primary jobs, which is why you, along with the city of Medford and the two counties created so ready in 1987, is to respond to those types of jobs because they create the income that then helps um, uh, build up your downtowns and other service and retail sector jobs. You'll see a picture there of the herb farm. That's one of the companies that there's a story about in your uh, brochure that you have there about the One Rogue Valley strategy. Herb farm today has over 250 employees. They are based in Williams, but this last year they actually expanded for the first time in their 50 year history to Jackson County because they now have products that go to Europe. And so they need to be near that airport. So when they started their application, they're one of the enterprise zone applications. They had 189 employees and now they have uh, 250 employees. And they are an exporting firm, not yet captured in this data since this is lagging a couple of years, but they are an exporting firm. During this time, and it seems like so long ago and yet not, we went through a pandemic. And so, so already pivoted during that time, as you know, to provide hope to businesses, 557 businesses, $6.8 million in pandemic grants. That was the 451. And then right along that same time, Jackson County experienced a horrific wildfire and we were able to get some dollars out to wildfire victims. Some of it was the So Ready Foundation money, and some of it was through the United Rotary Clubs of Southern Oregon, of which maybe some of you are a Rotary member. There is one picture down there on the bottom that is Heavenly Sweets Bakery was the recipient, one of the, the grants early on in the pandemic. So Ready has also operated a gap financing program since 1994. There are over 110 clients that have been out of Grants Pass and Josephine County combined since 1994. It's about $8.8 .8 .8 million that was lent through So Ready as our part of gap financing. During this reporting period, we uh, brought on 14 new loan clients, about 2.4 million. And at the same time, 17 of them paid off, which is actually a good thing because that means they're doing well, they're finding uh, better financing, they're in a position to keep their business going stronger. Uh, and you can see there are 23.2 million lent since 1994. A couple of the most recent loan clients that are in Grants Pass is the Bohemian Bar and Bistro, Ready Ride, and Weekend Beer Company. 
I mentioned earlier that the uh, Enterprise Zone also includes hotel development. In this reporting period, nine new hotels took out Enterprise Zone applications and they are authorized by the assessors. Three of those have not yet started construction. It's 893 new hotel rooms. One of those hotels is in your territory. It was the Hampton Inn. They're obviously up and running, but you can see that tourism really is a big deal in our region. And we're always looking for another hotel that may like to develop over here in Grants Pass. So if you come across one, please let them know that this benefit may be available to them. That's a picture of the Margaritaville Hotel in Medford. I mentioned this before, we just forge strong partnerships, not only with my counterparts, with Ruth at the SBDC and the Chamber, Grants Pass Chamber, but many others. Um, and this is how that money broke down during the wildfire. Uh, many of these businesses were absolutely destroyed. And to date, there has been no other money that has come through the state or otherwise to help these businesses, and we're still working on that. During the pandemic, we also received money from the Economic Development Administration for multiple purposes, of which we passed through about 73% of it to other projects, including small communities um, that were like the Butte Falls and the Jacksonvilles. They had to do something re relative to the pandemic. And so you can see that we gave $70,000 to placemaking grants to those communities, pictured as Jacksonville, and you may recognize Mayor Meadow Martell in the Illinois Valley and Butte Falls. We also passed through $30,000 to serve houseless populations, which included the Rogue Retreat, and a portion of that went to your warming uh, village, your warming center here in Grants Pass. After that time, uh, Soretti also took some of his administrative money and we gave it back and we helped uh, fund your Foundry Village. This is just looking forward to what we're doing now. We have been nimble and proactive from the get-go in 1987. You may be surprised to know that our budget is about $750,000, maybe even less, it's mostly professionals. We have no debt which is a good position to be. Many of the loan dollars that we've had over time have come from the EDA or the USDA, but we paid off all our remaining debt, so that makes us much more nimble. What's important for you to know now is that we're hiring another business development manager, which is a key thing to remember because in our strategy, the number one thing really is to understand more our business community and industry so we can find them and help them uh, with services to expand and grow that create jobs, new income, new capital investments that helps your property tax base. So we're going to be interviewing that person next week as a team and hopefully that person may be on in about a month if uh, it all works out. Uh, we work consistently to reduce dependence on jurisdictional membership such as Grants Pass. We appreciate that. This is specific data. I was fortunate enough to find our 1988 budget I wasn't on staff at that time, but uh, Councilor Riker knows I've been there for about 22 years. Uh, at that time in 1988, Grants Pass uh, contribution was 11.34% of all of our revenues to do what we do. And today it's 3.43%. So we are working hard to uh, attain more private sector memberships. We don't get a lot of money from the EDA either but we do use quite a bit of money that comes out of our loan, own loan program to do all that we do. And I believe that's my last slide. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take those or I can pass it on to my next colleague. Thank you, Colleen. Are there uh, questions, Council? Joel. Well, just for the benefit of people listening in and ourselves, a little bit of uh, economic background. Why is it so important for the export uh, revenue? The export revenue? Because really what makes an economy go is when, when someone's exporting, or what we often refer to as traded sector, it's bringing new wealth into our region and circulating in our economy. The difference between that and, say, a retail sector, it's our dollars just going back and forth. Exporting brings in new wealth and circulates in our economy. That's the answer. Okay. 
Then the second question was, um, I was wondering before, it seemed like marijuana was quite an export economy, and it seems like that's kind of gone bust. Um, is that in fact true, and what have the effects been on the local economy from that? Thank you for that question. Soretti is not permitted to work with cannabis and marijuana type mm -hmm. companies because of our connections to the Economic Development Administration. So I don't necessarily know all the detail on that. I would say it certainly has had an impact on our available buildings. As we know, we don't have a lot of buildings. There's that kind of thing in the past. But real granular data, unfortunately, I don't have for you, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Valerie. Yeah, I just want to go on from um, this one rogue valley um, because that was kind of like right before the pandemic yes. that's already put a lot of time, mm -hmm. time and energy in to try to make it um, like a regional concept. Um, have you able, been able to bounce back from that? Have you seen, um, have, you know, how has that transpired since it happened right before that? Um, yeah, thank you, Councillor. And that's what this report is all about. If you look in your, uh, this little thing, it will tell you all about what we were doing during this time. We weren't quiet, we were just uh, behind the scenes doing work. So what it's done for us today is now we're ready to get back to our primary charter, which is business development. We sometimes call that our North Star. That is what we were created to do with attracting companies and helping companies expand. We are looking uh, more proactively again to uh, going to trade shows and doing other things to drum up leads for our region. The challenge we have is we need to have a better inventory of properties and such ready to go for them. But I would say that we are back to full staff and need another one just to catch up and do even more in-depth work than before. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Colleen, I know that the needs of each company are unique, but is there a recommendation for one thing that the city of Grants Pass could do to be more appealing to businesses wanting to expand or come here? Well, I think this would go for any particular city. I recall um, it's been several years ago. We had a company in, uh, in one of the cities that came to me to, with me to do a presentation. And as we were walking back to their location, he said to me, it'd be great to have the counselors or the mayors or others actually come and visit us periodically. So I think the lesson to learn, and you are all busy, is, is to recognize a business and take time when you can to ask how they're doing when you're downtown at a, in a restaurant or whatever. It's like, I, th I think what we really need to have is a more business friendly attitude or curiosity about businesses all the time. And then you can always pass that information if they need help off to me or one of my colleagues and we're going to respond. So in a nutshell, having the most business friendly proposition you can have because without traded sector companies, there is no taxable base by which you provide services to your citizens. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I don't see any hands. I think we're ready for our next presentation. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Right. Next, I'd like to introduce to you Chuck Rund. He's the interim president and CEO for Grants Pass and Josephine County Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I'll hand it off to Chuck. Just advance the slides here. Great. Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh, well, good. Uh, good afternoon. Just barely. Um, uh, I'm pleased to be with you today. Thank you, uh, Dana and uh, Mayor Bristol and council members. Glad to be here to uh, report uh, on business in our local community from a Chamber of Commerce perspective. Um, I particularly like the opportunity today because I think the two great systems that America has been able to develop as a, as a country, it all filters down even to our local area, is one of government that can kind of control us 
even back from the founding fathers, and then the idea they had that there should be enterprise and some role for business in a unique way to share with them. And when you think of all the institutions of our nation, those are the two biggest and most dynamic that exist. In fact, we spend more time in the world with money than we do with arms. And that somehow says a great deal about who we are and where we, we're going and how we share. We at the Chamber have a small piece of this relationship with you in, in the city, and I'd like to report a bit on that today. Also, this is, by the way, is our 100th year uh, as a Chamber in uh, Grants Pass, and we're delighted with that. Uh, to, be the, be the, to be the case. So with that, I'm going to report primarily on our, uh, our visitor center at the north end of town and give you some of the data that's there. You've been there, I'm sure, a number of times. And this is that area and the location where we are from a few different angles. We're actually in the process of painting the building, hopefully this, uh, this spring, and looking to do that. But what's new? Um, well, the first thing is, is that uh, this is a picture of uh, your city manager, Aaron, and the governor, uh, Kotek, uh, with Josie Malloy, whose position I've taken. So beware, I've been on the job six weeks. You're all in trouble. I'm kidding. But the, but the idea that, uh, you know, we're, we're here, so that's exactly what's going on. But that's the new thing that's taking place. The chamber has uh, uh, had Josie move on. She's taken a job actually back in the state of Wyoming and is working, uh, working back there. Um, and I have joined in as that interim uh, uh, position for this, uh, for this per per period of time. Uh, we have some new people in the staff. I sure, most of you know Shirley Liska. Uh, she's a fabulous person. She's running our front office and all of the volunteers inside of the, uh, of the chamber. And she's doing quite a quite effective job. She's uh, extremely engaging and uh, friendly with, uh, with everyone who shows. Uh, we actually have 12 knowledgeable and, and uh, learned uh, volunteers who work four-hour shifts. Uh, they prepare for the entire tourist season that starts heavily here in May, and we're actually doing some special training uh, with them uh, this year around implementing emergency and safety plans and some conflict resolution ch uh, training, those kinds of things. Uh, we're living in a different world uh, that needs uh, special handling and special care, and uh, those trainings are, are very important. To, uh, to, to, to take a look at and move forward. Um, so let's look a little bit at the Visitor Center. This is our first quarter's uh, report in terms of what has happened at the Visitor Center. As you can see, it talks about the number of visitors who've been there, the number of phone calls we've had, some small data in the middle, and then on the far right-hand side, some web page views. Um, what I'd like to point out is that the phone and visitors are about the same as they've been over the last several quarters of the last five years on the first quarter. Very, very similar, around 500, 450, 500, 600 maybe as a top set of numbers across that set of data. But what's intriguing about the far right-hand side is the web page views, as you can see, popped 100,000 uh, and, and 10 or so in uh, January in the 90s and 80s in February, March. This is 140,000 more than we had last year and uh, at this same period of time. So there's a great deal of people searching out, they're picking the chamber, they're going and finding out where the resolute, what, what's taking place in the community, and they're seeking uh, to get information about where Grants Pass is and should they come. I think some of this data with what uh, 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 Terry Middlestat's done in terms of the hotelry and the tourists, applying this set of data with that set of data to talk about flow would be an interesting way of uh, you know, setting up a little joint partnership here on some data items to look, but it looks like a buoyant year compared to years in the past. Uh, we're doing several things around the, the, the property. One is we've uh, introduced some signs of no trespassing. We have a 24-7 uh, uh, video surveillance signage around the properties. We've scheduled and served with Grants Pass to refresh the landscape in May, so we've got some gardeners coming by to, uh, to work on that. And we're installing some please clean up, clean up after your pets I don't know if you've ever stopped by there for more than 15 minutes, but there are a lot of people that have a lot of pets, and they show up right around that caveman, you know, on a regular basis. It's, uh, it's, we have little packets, and, uh, and, and you know they're pretty good at actually using them. So that's helpful for, for all of us, I think, you know, uh, in, in that regard. Um, some obstacles that we, uh, we face. 
Um, the, the top of the, this first obstacle is a, there's a lack of dated uh, and printed material. Um, if you haven't noticed, we, we're a QR society. Give me your QR codes and I'll be really happy to involve with you. So it's going electronic, whether we want it to or not. And people are just not printing the, the print materials that we normally keep in the visitor center. The facilities are a little antiquated if you've been in there. It's lovely wood and structured wood and things like that. But we need to move along to some electronic elements. And we currently uh, don't have an allocated budget for that, but we're looking around to see what kind of funds we can get and grants to put that together and are doing a pretty good job with that. Um, locational challenges um, are slightly different. Um, and these are just a heavy transit area around uh, where we live. Um, there's some routine uh, al uh, altercations that take place uh, there. There's visitor parking uh, and people come in for a prolonged period of time, kind of camp there, unload all their things in their car, put everything back in their car. Some stay for a couple of days if they can, uh, but they normally you know, leave you know, on a daily basis, but that's going on. And there's a great deal of increased trash paraphernalia, property damage, and graffiti. Um, uh, I've seen more arrests personally in my life in the last five years, in the last month, uh, working at the chamber. And so I just want you to know that we are very proud that the police come and take care of things on a regular basis and are very, are very much around there. We're also taking some training. I'm starting Thursday with the safety meeting that's taking place that the city is providing and we'll be uh, upgrading our thinking and, and how we can better address this as we go on. But clearly, it's, it's, it's an issue for all of us. We've been facing it in, as a community in several ways and different ways, and so, and so is the chamber. Some community and visitor center resources. Our, the event calendar we have is, invites everyone in the community to use it. In fact, everyone tries to use it a great deal. There's no fee for membership, no requirements uh, at all, and the daily courier and radio stations really use the data they find there and, uh, and discuss them. Uh, pretty proactively in the community. We have an event board up with a, a set of magnetic uh, displays for the community to show off what's going on. And it's used pretty frequently. I mean, people come by, they ask, we talk about it. It's quite, it's, it's quite useful and handy. Uh, the 2024 Profile Magazine is going out in May. Um, it goes out countywide, distributed to the hotels, restaurants, real estate offices, tourist attractions, wineries, anybody who wants some. And it'll be available for all of you as well. Uh, so it's a, a very, very engaging uh, piece that's going forward. In terms of moving forward, we're promoting tourism, attracting uh, uh, with attractions and local businesses, a continuous volunteer training to optimize our visitor experiences, uh, recruiting volunteers, updating the inside of the center, interactive electronic calendars where we can use them, uh, upgrading the equipment and painting, as I mentioned, the outside of the building. Um, with that, I would like to close and say thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, you inviting us to be here and with my fellow business colleagues uh, to report on, uh, on what we're doing at the chamber. So if there are any questions, I'm wide open. If I don't know the answer, I apologize in advance. So but please ask. Thank you, Chuck. It's nice to have you be able to just uh, seamlessly take over, at least uh, if, if there are seams, don't tell us, okay? Because it looks good from here. <laughs> questions? I just have a question. Bell. Yeah, I have a question, and that's just because I know that, you know, for years um, you guys send out relocation packets and that sort of things. If you get calls from people that are interested, yeah. have there been um, an increase, a decrease in people looking, or do you still send out packets for relocation to people who are interested? Yeah, we do send out packets of, for relocation for people who are interested. And there are some people that call and, and, and are interested in that. Um, but that's not a top item that's, that's there. They're not looking at the chamber primarily for that. I, what they've done is they've kind of, it seems to us, they've skipped on and gone right straight to the real estate companies. So we used to play more of a go-between and uh, we have a lot of realtors, if you didn't know, uh, in the area and they're doing a pretty good job of getting their name out and therefore kind of slicing off that piece of business. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions for the chamber? Thank you. All right, thank you for being here. And finally, I'd like to introduce Ruth Swain. She's the executive director for Row Community College's Small Business Development Center.
Thank you, Dana. Mayor and Council, it's so uh, such an honor to be here with you. Thank you for giving us this time. Um, it's also an honor to be here with our colleagues and fellow agencies all working together <clears throat> to make a difference for the economy and small business in our region. Um, our mission is building Oregon's best businesses and the Small Business Development Center here is part of a network of 20 across the state and I'd like to just see if I can operate the equipment here. Uh, so first of all, thank you for so supporting small business. Um, Grants Pass has been investing in our work to support small business for a number of years. And we also receive state and federal uh, funding. We also receive some funding from Josephine County. And um, of course, Rogue Community College is our host and sponsor. And so we are honored to have uh, multiple funding partners to support small business. I also want to thank you for the support of your team. Uh, we have amazing uh, partnership with the city and um, Dana Pierce, of course, and James Conway have done an amazing job just from my perspective. Um, we've also had wonderful interactions with Bradley Clark and Eric Wade. And um, we're also grateful for your investment in community development block grant funds as a sponsorship for our lower income uh, homes and communities or residents here who are starting a business. We'd like to grow that program and recently met with Ann and looking to help increase the support for our underserved um, homeowner or home residents who would like to start a business. <clears throat> we offer two primary services, and that is one-on-one -on -one confidential no-cost advising. And I can tell you from personal experience, it is very rewarding work to be able to sit um, respectfully with someone who has an idea or who has a business that needs to grow. Um, we also offer low cost classes as a, as a means to increase that training in a short period of time. As I said, we serve about half of our clients are pre-venture, we call it. They've got sometimes what sounds like a crazy idea and they go out and make it work. Uh, and so we work with them on that basis. It's not just one meeting. We, we allow unlimited number of meetings and we assign homework and we do help research with our clients. We also work with helping businesses to expand. And in one of those areas, we have a deeper dive called small business management. And we also have a number of people who are looking to retire and we work with them on helping to prepare the business and to look at what lifestyle they would like to have as they sell um, and exit business ownership. We always like to tell a couple of stories. Uh, Mike and Jody Apland have been meeting with us for a number of years. They signed up for a small business management program and uh, they continue to be uh, part of, you know, the people we've gotten to know very closely at the SBDC. Last year we had some changes in our, the makeup of our clients, but our center still continues to be performing very highly within the state we had the highest uh, number of jobs created locally, and we didn't create the jobs, our small businesses did, and we meet with them and document uh, some of that work. 
we also had the fourth highest center for number of clients who achieved uh, financing. They got a loan to purchase land, build a building, expand, buy equipment. Um, we have uh, Delia Warner is a capital access, access advisor who has long time banking experience. So we don't give out loans, but we help uh, prepare clients for an application to a so ready uh, loan or the Illinois Valley revolving loan fund that, that you helped establish um, through IVCDO. We also had some sales increase. I think these are encouraging indicators that there are our businesses in our region that are growing, expanding, and continuing to reinvest. Uh, 14 new business starts last year. That's not our highest on record. Uh, and part of this is we know that more of them started. We just couldn't get them uh, to slow down and sign a form to confirm that they started their business. We've had a lot of construction company startups and they're out busy from early morning till late in the evening. <clears throat> We serve 605 total clients in advising and our classes last year. We're working on improving our training programs. Uh, new ones that we added were human resources, how to attract and retain employees, um, and also digital marketing. It's really critical for all of us to understand if we're going to run our business, how are we marketing? And the World Wide Web is a daunting task, and there's social media and lots of new changes there. So we try to keep up with that. We also follow and uh, value the business survey that our chamber sponsors every year. Just a quote from one of our clients. The class was so refreshing. It motivated me to keep going forward and keep following my dream. We do serve in two locations on the Redwood campus of Rogue Community College. They graciously provided us a home there uh, when the building downtown was sold. And we continue to have clients find us on a daily basis there. We also have, uh, through a partnership, with Boys and Girls Clubs and Josephine County, we have um, advising in the Illinois Valley at the Kirby Building. It used to be owned by the college and now Boys and Girls Club. There is a commercial kitchen there and we will provide services for all food startups, no matter what commercial kitchen they're using. But this is one where we specifically have an agreement with Boys and Girls Club. One of our clients last year um, was is a fire, in the firefighting business. That's one of the growth industries that we've seen. It usually is one or two employees, and they need to purchase major equipment. And our advisor worked with them to develop a cash flow process because, you know, during the fire season, there's a lot of revenue coming in, and off season there isn't. And also to look at, instead of paying cash for a major purchase, you can finance it and during that process build your credit score. Michelle Gallus, as uh, one of the leading child care providers in our region, has been a client with us for many, many years and continue to see her as she plans her business. I will say that these clients that we mentioned have given us permission because our advising is confidential unless they sign the authorization to share their name. A lot of partners that we've mentioned some of them today. Um, I do want to say that the work that you are investing in is really making a difference. Um, it's very meaningful work. We get to hear it from small businesses frequently. Uh, one of the um, clients who came to us recently um, was laid off, or will be imminently laid off from Dutch Brothers. 
and they came to us to start their own business so they could stay local. The state has a program to allow them to be on unemployment while they um, start their business, and so that is a, a number of um, our clients have been laid off and they want to get out there and follow the American dream. I will just say uh, through the QR code life we're living, we are offering a um, government contracting expo. We already have over 50 signed up for this event. It will be at the Royal Community College. We have uh, Jason Kennedy uh, from the city will be there along with Jos uh, Josephine County and Roque Community College. A lot of times businesses don't think about doing government contracting uh, as a means to grow their business and we feel like this is a very uh, important part of our work. And that summarizes what I like to share with you today. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Council, do you have any questions? <clears throat> Valerie? I don't really have a question. I just have a comment because I've worked with all of you and I, and I can't thank you enough for getting out there and doing the down and dirty work that it takes and the constant contact and building the businesses in our community because we do know that they are the backbone um, of everything we do. So thank you. All right, no questions. Thank you uh, very much, Ruth. And um, as well as, as um, so ready and the Chamber of Commerce for being here today and giving us your updates. Always nice to have you and uh, glad to hear that you're working well with Dana and uh, she doesn't bite and we'll keep things moving forward here. Let's uh, move on to the Reed Building, huh? We have Brad Clark here to present about building in Riverside Park. Right. Good morning. It's good to see a couple of you at the uh, Arbor Day celebration this morning. We had a good uh, good time out there. We didn't get rained on and some ambitious uh, fourth and fifth graders. Um, so we're going to continue a discussion here about the um, uh, the Reed building, uh, the cottage there at uh, Riverside Park. Um, this was initiated from a July 23 motion from the historic uh, Historical Buildings and Sites Commission about uh, preserving that building and, and uh, there's a couple of summary slides I'll just uh, you've seen a couple of times now I'll go over quick but before I get into it uh, we do have uh, Ward here Ward Warren the chair of HBSC I also have uh, Ken Sandlin our building official um, who helped work on some of the um, numbers and looking at looking at the building from a through the building uh, code lens um, so they can, uh, they're, they're here as part of our uh, resources and presentation today. Uh, so again, this, this conversation really started with the motions from HBSC uh, back in July. Um, they made two motions. One of them relates to having the building become a local landmark. Uh, the second one, which is really where you began to focus your energies in your conversation um, last, last fall, uh, was uh, a motion to um, receive repair and maintenance to stop any deterioration and preserve its opportunity for future use. Um, and also that the city investigate possible uses for the building. Um, the council, as you know, hasn't taken formal action on either one of these motions. Um, to date, you've kind of focused in on this uh, one behind me, motion number two, and um, so that's where kind of the energies have been put. Um, in July, you reviewed those motions, and then in August, uh, City Council did a tour of the site. October, we did an open house. 
There was also some news coverage at there at that event. Um, we also did a community survey. And then uh, February 12th was your last meeting on this topic. Um, you discussed the motions again, um, requested some additional cost estimate, and then some grant resources. That was one of the main topics that you talked about at your, at your February meeting. So today we, we, we do have a, a couple of updates for you on that. Um, you've seen these, uh, essentially 25% of the survey respondents um, voted to demolish, 75% voted to save. Uh, there was a number of different ideas that were put forward through the survey. Um, just including these uh, photos in the presentation in case you want to go back and refer to any of them. I, I won't highlight any of them since you've seen them a couple of times now. But mostly what I wanted to do today was go a little bit more detail on the three options I think that are really in front of you. Um, preserve or rehabilitate the building, the structure as it is. And the second one would be to, to demolish the structure but to rebuild a similar one. Um, and then the third would be to demolish without rebuilding. So we've got a little bit of detail on each of those. So I, th I think for this first one, um, this, this would basically seek to save as much of this structure that's there as possible. Um, this is the option that offers probably the most grant opportunity um, in talking to and, and uh, researching some of the foundations and government agencies that offer historic preservation grants. Um, those really are focused primarily on, uh, you know, using the funding to rehab an existing structure, not to uh, build a replication, for example. Um, Curry Gill uh, is the state's uh, historic preservation, she's at the state's historic preservation office. Um, uh, she did encourage the city to have a preservation expert perform an on-site assessment. Um, I think I had mentioned that early on. Uh, the main reason for that is there really is a difference um, when you're a, a contractor or a builder or an architect. If you don't have any background or any experience in rehabbing or looking at historic structures, um, there's, there's just a, there's things that you can sometimes pick out um, uh, that may be an opportunity to, to rehabilitate the structure. Um, and that's certainly not always the case. Um, Curry mentioned to me that, you know, maybe 50% of the time when, when they have a, a historic preservation expert go out, you know, that results in a different, uh, a different end outcome. Um, uh, we, have, uh, we have not done that. We have not put any money uh, uh, towards this other than staff time. Um, so that, that would likely require, you know, some money to, to have them do that. Um, George Kramer, uh, local res preservation expert, uh, has also said that he's willing to, to come out to the site and, and uh, offer ideas for uh, recommendations to the, to the city for preserving the structure. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we do have the LB 6395 as well as the uh, Urban Renewal Agency. Um, I'll give a little bit more information about those funds here in a second. The second option would be to reconstruct um, or, you know, basically do a replication of the, of the structure that's there. Um, this would likely demolish most or all of it. Um, there's already been a deck taken off of it that was um, a hazard. So um, that, that is uh, already gone. There's also several code things that can, Ken can speak more to, um, but one of those, for example, is on the back side of the house. Um, it, it slopes down and it's, you know, it's, it's a substandard height in the, in the back room. So obviously that would be an example of something that in a replication um, we would not be able to do, um, replicate the, you know, the six foot, two inch height that's there today. Um, there's also the, the possibility if you went this route of, of uh, you know, choosing that building envelope that it's currently on or somewhere else. Um, that's, uh, there's, there's, there are limited options, I will say, in terms of where in Riverside Park you would put a, you know, an 800 to 1,000 foot structure. Um, but there certainly are other options. So that, that would be just a consideration for you today. Um, 
Historic preservation grant funds would not likely be accessible for this option, so we'd probably be looking at you know, the public-private partnership option or you know, other city funds. And then in the table below is where we have uh, the, uh, the numbers, um, obviously not, not big numbers in terms of the first, two light, uh, first three rows there. Um, there. There would need to be that asbestos test that's required uh, for option one and two, but not a demolition. Um, on the actual cost of an abatement, um, until that test comes back, we know exactly what we're working with. Um, that's, that's kind of an unknown number. Um, support panels for the electrical that's there, um, $1,500. And then the, the range that, that uh, we're looking at for a new structure, and again, the assumptions here are about 800 square feet. Um, I put in parentheses a box because, you know, at this point, we, we don't have a design, we don't have a floor plan, uh, we, we, we haven't uh, discussed a, a, a use with a partner. Those are all incredibly important in terms of getting a, a cost. And so we would need to know, you know, everything from kitchen to office space to, you know, counters, things like that. So uh, this just assumes that 800 square foot um, with... It does assume wood windows though and wood siding. Um, and then one entrance, which is what the structure has today, is just the one entrance and then uh, the ADA toilet lavatory. Um, so those were the assumptions that went into that, to that figure. On the demolition option, uh, we did get an updated bid on that. $7,500 was the, was the more recent bid, which is a little below actually what we gave you uh, last time. Um, and then uh, that last bullet we've talked about a couple of times, any demolition of a structure that is on the National Register. Um, this, this structure, while not in, individually on the register, it is part of the park, um, so it, it falls under the same rules. Um, HBSC would have to hold a hearing. Um, there are some guidelines that are given to the city in ORS, uh, since we are the owner uh, a government owner of a property that is uh, on the National Register, there are other responsibilities that we have, some of which you're doing. Um, you have to go through the process of, of determining the feasibility of, of other uses, um, looking at uh, options. Uh, there are, that doesn't mean a demolition option is not before you as an option, but it does mean that, you know, the hearing has to be held at HBSC and we do have to probably get uh, more uh, more of a written plan for how the um, el other elements of that structure, for example, may be able to be incorporated into, you know, say a kiosk or integrated into some other part of the park, um, basically continue to honor the heritage that is of the Reed building. So um, some work would, would still need to happen there. Brad, do you have any idea how much it would cost to have a preservation expert do the on-site assessment? It would not be much. It's probably in that $2,000 range. Okay. Yeah. That, that would be at the high end. Rob has a question. Hey, Brad. Um, so I got a question on the uh, asbestos test, um, $1,000 cost. And it said it wouldn't be required uh, if it was demolished. And it just, you know, I think Steve Nelson is, has you know, stood in front of the council so many times worried about doing demolition safely in an environmentally uh, responsible manner, et cetera, et cetera. It just kind of boggles my mind that you could knock down a building that might be full of asbestos and you wouldn't have to do the test first. Doesn't that seem really, yeah, uh, it, doesn't, me, it doesn't jive with, with my understanding of how things are supposed to go. Can you elaborate sure, on that? Let me have Ken speak to that. So the asbestos testing would be necessary regardless of if it was demolition or remodel type work. It was specifically for lead testing that would not be required for the demolition, but only for the remodel. Okay, so this is not correct then, what's in front of us. That's correct. Thank you. My apologies. Um, so the, the um, in terms of, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor, did you have other? Okay. In terms of potential funding resources, the Urban Renewal Agency, um, so 
I believe uh, one of the counselors brought this up last time. Uh, Riverside Park is a project that's listed in the Urban Real Agency. Um, the statement that's there on the screen is the only information that we really have uh, pertaining to it, but um, it, there is this, this clause uh, and other features that would benefit the citizens and attract more visitors to the park in Grants Pass. Um, you know, that leaves it pretty wide open that uh, I think if you wanted to use URA money, um, that Riverside Park allocation, uh, this, this probably could be a potential. Um, Councillor Pell mentioned the certified local government last time. Um, the, there are eligible expenses that include pre-development costs, um, like building preservation design, construction costs for building on the National Register. Um, the maximum grant is, is 15,000 on that with a, with a one for one match. Um, and you'll see that, that's, that that range is pretty similar for, for a lot of these funders. Um, you're certainly not talking about enough money to, to, do, to do a, uh, uh, a full reconstruction or rehabilitation. Most of these would be monies, for example, used to, to um, hire an architect or to do some of the um, initial design work. Um, the Oregon Heritage Grant, uh, the Preserve Oregon uh, Group, 3,000 to 20,000 is the range for their grants, uh, similar to the CLG, 50% um, match. Um, there's a fall 2025 deadline. Um, they have kind of a two-year cycle, so we, uh, there would be a while before that one would come and open. Uh, the National Park Service, the NPS, they have a historic preservation fund, several competitive grant programs there. Um, there are, they, they do have funding for CLGs under that for 50,000 or less in population. Um, they do not fund construction of new buildings um, or reconstruct historic properties, but uh, there are some other, other, as I mentioned, design options there. There's also the National Trust for Historic Preservation. They've got eight different programs, uh, mostly focused on specific states. Uh, Oregon's not one of those as far as special initiatives. Um, but uh, we are eligible under their National Trust uh, Preservation Funds option. Um, and, and again, those range between 2,500 and 10,000. The Kinsman Foundation is a, a very active uh, private foundation up in Milwaukee, Oregon. Uh, they, they do a lot of funding of historic preservation work, um, typically capping out around 5,000 on their grants. And then the Oregon Cultural Trust um, you would need a, a cultural organization as an applicant on that. The city wouldn't uh, be uh, likely eligible for a historic preservation on that. But if there was a, a cultural nonprofit, for example, that wanted to take the lead, um, they do offer grants uh, through the Oregon Cultural Trust, and there may be an option there. In terms of funding, uh, these are uh, similar to the last time that we talked about the LB6395. There's a $390,000 cash balance. Um, the, uh, the Reed building, uh, maintenance shop, Riverside stage, we do, the, the most current estimate on the stage is about 350,000. Um, that is probably going to increase once we get all the final electrical. And as you remember, we did, we, we upgraded the power on there. Um, so that's, uh, that's like, going to push that up a little bit. But as the last bullet says um, that Isaac Walton, uh, Isaac Walton building funding, you had um, wanted that to be used for the stage. So, um, you know, that's not going to be enough. So some of that LB 6395 would need to be pulled from um, to, to uh, have a project like this. And then the URA allocation is the 1.7 million. So a call to action, uh, it's at your discretion. I summarized those uh, three different options there, unless uh, council has other options you want to discuss. Questions, Rick. Thank you, Brian. So if we were to look at the preservation, are there specific rules on that? For instance, could they totally gut the interior and redesign that, but just keep the exterior, or do you have to preserve the interior as well? I'm going to ask Ken to maybe give some thoughts on that. As, as far as building code goes, you could do whatever you wanted on the inside of the building. I'm not sure as far as the historic portion of it uh, would not be in my expertise. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Val? Kind of 
coming off of that, I mean, because I, I toured the inside of it, and I, I know the historical significance because of the time, you know, and it was originally there with the park, but I don't ever really, inside, it, it seemed like you're really basic, it didn't really seem to have a lot of historic um, anomalies or anything that would make it stand out as terms of historic. So, um, in terms of cost, I can't see, you know, I know my husband's done buildings in historic districts where he's had to do gingerbread and a lot of things to the outside of the building to make it match with the, the environment in that area. But there's nothing that I can think of, and maybe I'm not an expert, maybe that's why we need to bring the expert in, but I don't really see anything historically significant that we would have to replicate. Is that true? We'll uh, bring up those interior, a few of the interior images here. Um, you know, it, it uh, has the fairly short ceiling on it. Um, the, uh, the, the windows um, are those, you know, the multi-pane uh, glass windows. Um, the, the flooring, as you may recall, does have a slope to it. So we, uh, we are expecting um, right, some, some uh, damage uh, or rot to the to the to the floor joists, um, uh, the way that those are sitting, um, you know. Uh, again, we haven't actually had a, a an expert to come in and look, but I mean, here's you know, this is most of the interior reflecting some of these. Uh, uh, there's really not a lot of you know custom woodwork or anything that you might also find in a in a another building that really relevates. So I, I, I think that most of it is you're talking about the, uh, the period 1920, um, as well as the fact that it has, you know, it has not moved. Uh, the, the exterior uh, has uh, remained fairly similar throughout that whole period of time. But Ward probably also has some other thoughts on it too, and he's, he's here today. Brian. Thank you, and thank you for doing the research on the grand opportunities. Um, I know the park superintendent isn't here, but uh, we've had conversations about their facility directly behind this building and them needing some upgrades there. Is there any way this building could play into that and help out Parks Department, whether it's with office space or any other kind of space? Yeah, as far as office space would go, uh, that would be a, a perfect allowed use for the structure. I can say in being in the a building, uh, whenever I met there with the contractor to go over some of this pricing, uh, there is some significant damage uh, that will need to be taken care of in the building. Like, I don't think there's much of a foundation under it. Uh, we didn't get into any selective demolition, uh, but over toward the west end, the floor probably dives off about three inches. So. There's obviously some rot to the joists or, or the walls, which would have to be opened up to see that. There's some overhang damage, uh, so it's, it would take some um, substantial work to get it back into good shape. All right, thank you. Rick. Do you know the age of the asphalt tile on the roof that's a recent roof or needs to be replaced or? So uh, some of the overhangs are actually rotten and some of the tails on the north side of the building or south side of the building. Uh, so I would assume that in this process, we'd need to tear the roof off and, and um, repair some of the rot that's under there. And whenever we did come up with the, the costing also, uh, it was for, like Brad said, it was for the wood windows, the wood siding like it is, the front porch reconstructed to look exactly the way it is right now and also for doing tongue and groove for the overhangs like what are on the building right now. Brad, with regards to the URA um, allocation um, that's currently, or earmark kind of uh, 1.7 million, was there, were there any particular projects associated with that that you're aware of? Uh, the only projects that were identified are the amphitheater, stage area, restrooms, spray park, meeting space, and then other features that would attract visitors. So pretty, pretty broad open, but this, this is the only project list 
of the URA that's associated with Riverside that's in the plan. Are there, um, is, is there work needing, needed to be done to the restrooms? Because I don't think they've had any upgrades recently. So those are all projects. This, I mean, the spray park, I think, is done or? Okay, so yep. these other things are yet to be done. Um, right. But could still be done with funding. Right. The restrooms that are, you know, right there associated with the maintenance yard have been closed for closed. quite some time and do need some work. Um, so, you know, in terms of um, the priorities, you know, we've, we, we brought those a few years ago and uh, uh, have been focused on the, on the, amp, on the stage. The stage. You know, the, okay. So that's the only project that's really on, on the table right now is working on that stage. And, and the maintenance yard. I mean, we, we have done right. some initial work on, on upgrading the maintenance yard, expanding the fencing a little bit so that uh, there can be better maneuvering of the vehicles through there. So those are, those are the uh, main two. Okay, thank you. Valerie, then Rob. Okay, coming off of that question, has there been money put away for the maintenance in that part of it in the parks department? We, we do have, um, each year we're putting some of this 392,817 is the LB project um, that is specific to the rebuilding the park maintenance shop and, and the stage. So with regards to the stage, uh, you'd mentioned that, uh, you know, you, we expect the price to, to go up it seems as though, even by our standards, that project is really, really slow. So when can we expect the next uh, step there to be done so we have a better idea on the, uh, the funding requirements? To yeah, the, the uh, Thornton, uh, I believe, is, uh, I don't know if Jason knows, I mean, we're 60, 70 percent, I mean, in terms of the, the design completion. So it's, it's coming along. It's um, the, the electrical um, was part of that because we had to identify the easement to go from Park Street, you know, kind of on the back side of the ball field there to go down to where the stage is going to be. Um, so a surveyor work, you know, that, that was completed. Um, so a lot of the work's been done. We just, we just need to get on your agenda. I think we're, we're really within a few weeks probably of being able to present something. Sure. Uh, Joel, and then did you have a hand up, Brian? Okay, Joel, go ahead. Um, I just needed some clarification. Um, the Isaac Walton Fund, the LB8580, that goes, that was already available then for the uh, um, Riverside Stage Project of 350000 Is that what that says? Well, we put unavailable because this is the... The, right. re, the, the rebuilding project. Um, so unless right. I think council changes your direction, then a hundred percent of that funding was going to go towards the stage. So then the then the LB sixty three ninety five would only have if the, these cost estimates stay the same, would have uh, a, about ninety six thousand dollar obligation then to the to the stage. Correct. I just want to make sure I understood that. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Brad. Thank you. Uh, Dwayne is online and he has a comment. Um, thank you. My, my comment is, is I would be better prepared today if there was a preservation specialist that had already um, Done that evaluations. I don't, I'm not sure I can make a decision on what way we should go if we haven't had that done yet um, on the building. And also knowing that inside the building, you know, from my little expertise, most of the inside is not historical popcorn ceiling that starts in the late 40s, 50s, those cabinets. I, I don't see anything inside that building that's historical. Um, um, so at this point right now, it's hard for me to make a decision which way to go forward, not knowing if that building, you know, if the preservation special hasn't looked at the building yet. Brian? I'm sorry, I did have one more question. Brad, you don't have to get up, but um, with regards to having the preservation expert look at it, um, 
in the slide it said George Kramer did the some other work on this, I believe. I, I, the question is, is, is George Kramer qualified to be that expert that the state representative uh, suggested that we might use for something like this? In my conversation, it, it sounded like he would, he would probably be able to, if it really got to the point of having somebody who has, uh, you know, is a uh, historical architect who actually specializes in the specifics of a design uh, of a certain era, uh, that's not going to be him, but he, you know, he's, he's has a lot of knowledge about the, the field. Um, he, his, his primary experience, you know, is putting the National Register nomination together, the package together for, this, for the National Park Service. Um, he's looked at, you know, for decades, many, many structures, and uh, I think would be the first logical step for us to take. And then if he did not feel like he could provide um, enough guidance from a design specific lens, then we would probably need to get somebody else. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm with Dwayne. I want to hear from uh, the preservation expert to see, get a little clearer picture of what cost might be to uh, preserve. Hey, again, I forgot that we had um, word here from the HBSC. Did you want to say a word? Could you please do that now? I should have done that before we started discussion. Uh, yeah, I would like to say a few things about it. Uh, I appreciate the staff doing the work that they've done um, on this. And uh, all of that is basically new information to me. Um, and nobody on the uh, HBSC has heard any of that new information either. Um, I want to say, you know, I've been dealing with historic buildings in this town for, you know, I don't know, over 35 years. And I have renovated many. I've received awards from the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know, several for building renovation in the past. Um, and I think, you know, this, to me, I look at this and this is simple. I know this house is not impressive to a lot of people. I've heard that comment. Um, and again, I want to emphasize the fact that it, it's not a mansion because it was the residence of the caretaker. Caretakers uh, were not paid to live in mansions. They didn't receive that kind of salary. Uh, they didn't need that kind of a residence. So it was a very utilitarian um, structure and it's also very typical in fact it was one of the eight um, styles architectural styles that the council approved in the uh, program that we that the HPSC developed for SDUs ADUs uh, ADUs and uh, and that is cottage it's a very common um, style that you see in Grants Pass of not the upper class. No, that's not who resided in cottages. It was the middle class and uh, even lower class, but working people, mostly middle class working people. And why is that structure important? Um, for the same reason that it's important in many parks that have been recognized by the National Park Service as Riverside Park has, which is huge for tourism. I mean, I know not everybody in this room is into historic, but believe me, it's, it's a very, very popular pursuit of tourists. It brings a lot of tourists. And really, the only money we've spent um, to get that designation as a historic landmark park from the National Park Service uh, was a new sign, because the other sign was deteriorating, a new sign on uh, 7th and Park Street, which cost a, a few thousand dollars, and it basically replicated the original sign on 6th Street. That's about it. That and, and some money to George Kramer for the National Register uh, nomination. So, but, you know, having been involved in, in a lot of building restoration, I look at that and go, you know, that building is a piece of cake. Uh, people hear the word asbestos and they freak out. I mean, pretty much every old building in this town and downtown had 
had uh, or has or had asbestos on it, including, you know, all of the buildings that I've dealt with, and it's not a big deal. Um, so there is a process uh, to keep people safe and so forth, but it's not that expensive and it's not a big deal. And I think if, if you think about it, if you think about what would your house look like if you had walked away from it and not done any maintenance for decades, um, this house is actually in pretty darn good shape considering the fact that it went that many years with zero maintenance. It's amazing to me to look at it and look how good it looks. And keep in mind that the HBSC, we don't have any say really over what goes on on the inside. I mean, ideally, we would prefer that the inside is kept as close, you know, as, as possible to, you know, the period. But we don't, when we do a review, it does not include the inside of the building. It only includes the exterior. Um, and so that's important to note. Um, I think it's significant to note that the motion uh, that the HPSC made was actually made by Nathan Miller, who is a developer and has developed some, he also uh, demolished, um, you know, a historic landmark building before he built the new structures there on at 4th and J. Uh, so he's been through the demolition process because he had to go through HPSC to get approval. And HBSC has approved every demolition that has come before us, every single one. Um, so this one we take exception to because of the historic importance. If, if any money should have gone into to rehabilitating this building, it should have been the Isaac Walton building because that was the town's community center. And there are a lot of people that, are, uh, that I hear regularly so they tore down that building. The city had that building torn down and it was super popular with the community. And there was a promise that it would be rebuilt. It never has been. So we have a city of 40,000 people, uh, probably one of the only ones that I know of that doesn't have a community center. And we have really one historic building in this park that is worthwhile. And that is the Reed Building. And why is it important? Because of the fact that it represents uh, uh, an important architectural style in Grants Pass and the fact that that caretaker uh, is responsible for shaping that park and making it what it is today. He, and then later his family, they lived in that little building there and they shaped that park for 50 years. And that's impressive. And if you go to Shore Acres Park over at the coast or just about any other park anywhere that is a landmark park, you will find that the caretaker's residence is there and has been restored and is celebrated. And I think it should be here as well. And I'm not here today to ask for money. Um, and maybe I should have been because everybody else was asking for money today. But, uh, uh, but, but anyway, I, I'm just here to ask for time, um, some time. That's all. I'm here to ask for, and how much time? Uh, I'm gonna say 90 days. And for what purpose? I'd like 30 days because that's about when our next Historic Building and Sites Commission meeting is, at which time I would like to share all of this information with the commission. Uh, and then I would like 60 days for us to do our due diligence, to contact whoever we need to contact. I want to, uh, I could actually, like I said, I think re, uh, restoring that building is, yeah, it's got damage, but it's really a piece of cake. It's, it, and there's no, you know, there's not a lot of fancy, you know, as to Valerie's uh, question, there, there aren't a lot of fancy, or there's not a lot of ornamentation and detail on that building. It's a very simple structure. So, you know, restoring the exterior is going to be a piece of cake. And so, I would like 30 days uh, to, you know, explore at our next meeting, talk about options with the commission, and then give us 60 days to do our due diligence to check out grants, uh, to talk to contractors. I've served as general contractor, and so has Nathan Miller on many projects. And we've had to deal with asbestos, uh, you know, with, with every issue and more than what this little cottage has. So 
I would, that's all I'm here for is to ask you for 90 days uh, before you make a decision. Thank you, Ward. Any questions? Joel. Joel. So as part of that 90 days, would you recommend that we go ahead and get the um, expert to come in and assess it as well from, the, from uh, as, as an outside independent contractor? Um, you know, as, as was this, suggested by would the I report. recommend that? Is that what you're asking? Um, I, I think it, uh, yeah, you might as well because you're going to need to do it either way. Uh, and it's not an asbestos test is not a big deal. Um, I was actually surprised it was, you know, a thousand dollars. I just had to have one done, um, and I'm not sure, you know, what what the final cost of that was. But I know I had to have remediation done, and the crew came in and did it, and it it wasn't that big of a deal. But yeah, I think since it has to be done anyway, might as well. So then the other thing is under uh, the demolition option, it's a uh, law that. Uh, the owner has to um, um, gather input from the private sector as to uses of the building, um, and that 90 days then that could also be done. Is that, is that what hopefully? I yeah, I mean, I've already talked to a couple of people in the private sector that I asked them, "Would you be interested in, in being the concessionaire of the little reed building in Riverside Park?" And they said, "Definitely." Uh, they had some concerns because of the, you know, the homeless situation in the park and the reputation that, you know, that that has right now. But they said if that wasn't really um, still a concern, a big concern, that yes, they would definitely be interested. So I would, I would be, you know, the Historic Commission has provided a lot of valuable um, things to this town in terms of uh, downtown and in terms of other things such as the the Redwood Empire sign and you know uh, and we do I mean pretty much everything we do and downtown as well is at pretty low cost and so I mean, I mean my goal with this would be to do the same thing with this and to try and find a, a private sector partner uh, that um, and then possibly also look at um, lining the walls with, uh, you know, making it a local museum of, of sorts, you know, with displays on the walls of the park and the evolution of the park um, and the bridge since it's right there. Uh, or another uh, thing that was mentioned was um, a museum or display of uh, Native American uh, local tribes, uh, artifacts and so forth. And that could be uh, one source of funding for that could be the cultural uh, coalition. So, um, so anyway, there's a lot of possibilities, and that would be the goal: is not tear it down, but to restore it and to and to use it and make it functional and to celebrate that what the that caretaker did for the park and have a functional structure that people would like to visit and hopefully do it in such a way that ultimately it costs the city nothing that would be the goal so that's that's basically um what i'm asking for simply is just some time did you have a question val Actually, I did have a question, and that was I was bringing up the ORS that said that we needed to identify and talk with private partners, you know, in the process, so that that would be that 90 days would be a time to also put out, you know, if, if anybody's really interested in, in taking it over and doing something with it and have evidence that that were to be the case. I think that's part of the process that we need to go through before we make a decision. So that goes along with the, you know, that. The 90 days or whatever it takes to get the information on the historic so then, preservationist and also get information on if there is a private partner that would be interested in looking into partnering to do something in the park with that and make it feasible. Because I, I can't see us running anything, but that's something that I think might be a private partnership. Yeah, I, I think that that's... Um I know just as an entrepreneur that, um, and I'm not a restaurant guy, but I would be, I would be very tempted uh, myself if I was looking at opening 
new businesses, I would be very tempted to um, lease that location and have a concession in there because I think it would be in, in that location, in that park, I think it would be incredibly uh, popular and successful. So the only way I can see it going beyond the 90 or 60 days for the, for the due diligence part would be just like if you have a real estate contract um, and you know you you have a contract with a, a realtor, a listing with a realtor, but you have a party that's interested in uh, moving forward, and even though their uh, listing expires, I mean, you know, at least you keep that active until you until you get a final answer: is the party going to buy it or not? And so I would say the only way that I could see it extending beyond the 60 days would be a situation where, you know, maybe we identify somebody in the private sector that's very interested, but we need some additional information from the city in order to make that happen. Uh, but other than that, I think, I think the 30 days until our next meeting and then the 60 days for the due diligence hopefully will be sufficient. All right, any further questions? All right, thanks for being here, Ward. And I think, um, I don't think we have any more questions for you. Thanks. Hi, I you uh, Rick, I think you were next. Rob, are you going next? I think Rick had his hand up before. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Oh, this, this is uh, uh, basically addressing um, Aaron. So a couple things. One is, um, you know, Brian brought up the possibility of the city being able to use that. Even though the parks director is not here, Josh Hopkins would be a nice one to hear from to see if that building could be used there. Uh, you know, once it if it was um, refurbished, so we'd like to know that possibility also. Does the city have a use for that building? Because that would really be the simplest thing for sure. Um, if in, the other thing is, I have to wonder. It just seems to me that um, you know, going out to try to find uh, potential private partners. Um, it would seem as though the requirement for demolition would be such where that would actually have to happen, I would think, after there's a demolition uh, movement in, in, in motion. In other words, that's not the kind of thing that we would do before a potential demolition was happening. So, in other words, you understand my point? So it doesn't make any sense to me necessarily to make that a requirement of this first 60-day or 90-day time frame that we're considering. The only reason why you'd probably do that is if you are wanting to keep that as an intent to demolish the building and do it in a more timely fashion than to wait to, to do that. So, um, But you would have to do it after you've actually essentially started the demolition process. You'd file for demolition yes, and that would be... Yes, we would be... So we doing would it before be going, and it wouldn't necessarily do anything. We would be doing a couple of things uh, contiguous with each other, but you would also be telling staff to go ahead and move and start the steps of doing a demolition project on that building. Okay, I, I don't know that we're ready to start those steps yet, but okay, thank you. Dwayne. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I've heard a, a lot, and I think a lot of us agree, um, and I think Ward has given us a lot of things to think about, and I think it's in our um, due diligence to give them their um, time, the 30 days and the 60 days, and get the preservation specialists out there and come back in um, 90 days and discuss this again, I don't think. Um, so I would move that we give them the, the 90 days he's asking for, get the preservation specialist, and then come back again, and then we make a decision after that of what we're going to do moving forward. Uh, that was a motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Brian. All right. Any further comment, Dwayne? No. Okay. Does anybody want to discuss that motion, Rick? Val? Uh, I, I don't really want to discuss it, but just in referring to back to what Rob was saying, I think the, the purpose of the demolition is to say, is there somebody that's interested in doing it so that when you're going to demolish, you can say, well, there's nobody interested. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't any use to us as a community. And so then to move, well, I mean, I'm not saying I want to demolish it. I'm just saying that I, that's something to look into. So, but I agree with what we need to move forward the 90 days. Okay, so uh, the motion was to, yeah, to give 90 days 
and have a preservation specialist come and analyze the building on site. Uh, Rick has a question. So I'm supportive of this direction, but I would like to think that the preservation consultant would also evaluate a total renovation of the interior of the building, as Ward mentioned, to open it up for display of photographs or pictures or artifacts that go back in time that reflect Grant's past history and the history of the park. I think that could be a real draw, but I think the current layout of the interior of the structure does not lend itself for that. So I would want to see um, the preservation consultant give their input as to whether we would have the option to change the interior layout. Thank you. Further discussion? All right, uh, let's vote. Uh, Dwayne, um, you made the motion, so you'll vote first. Um, yes. Let's, I'll just go with Rick since he's next to me. Go ahead, Rick. Yes. Val? Yes. Rob? Yes. Brian? Yes. DJ? Yes. Joel? Yes. All right, and we have lost Vanessa, but that's 7-0. Uh, Okay, any further discussion on that topic? Council or staff, you know, know what you need to do. Go ahead, Joel. Um, so the other thing is we have several other committees on the, um, on the city that um, we have the Parks Committee, we have um, COPA, we got um, a lot of different communities um, that look at things. And uh, if you look at that location and, and uses for that building, um, they probably also have a, an interest in that. Um, and so it just wouldn't hurt to let the other committees know during these 90 days of, uh, of possibilities. Um, and you know, whether it's uh, artifacts or whether it's a art museum or whether it's um, uh, a community center for a, uh, the parks department or, or uh, for a parks employee or whatever. That synergy, I think, between committees, we've heard about that before, where people needed to communicate across committees. And I, and I think that would be important. Good idea, I think that's a good idea. Uh, Rick? Do we need a separate motion for the evaluation of the interior? No, I think in general that was more of just a question, what are options for the interior? Um, we'll ask the preservation specialist. Thank you. Okay, anything further there? Nope. Okay, next up we have agenda review. And uh, we do have a meeting, a business meeting this Wednesday. And um, I'm just going to let you all know I'm going to move the Resolution designating heritage trees and renaming the Agnew Lytle Field up to the very beginning of the meeting following the Arbor Day proclamation. Um, and then we'll go into our public hearings. But we have public hearings on um, the CDGB uh, community development, I think it was in the wrong order, community development block grant needs and priorities for 2024, um, year five of that plan. Uh, resolution on the Parker's Place Resource Center special use permit and a public hearing on an ordinance that would annex um, the bus Buckmaster subdivision. And then our community uh, or council action items rather our ordinance uh, reviewing the humanitarian services ordinance again and to consider a motion that would adjust the general fund reserve policy a, and then our um, consent calendar has a resolution that would award the hydrogeologic master services agreement for the Merlin landfill, a resolution to award uh, the skate park refurbishment project, a resolution that would amend the tourism advisory committee membership to add a couple extra seats, uh, resolutions for ODOT IGA 6th and 7th Street multimodal, multimodal study. Uh, as well as the ODOT IGA for uh, US one, Highway 199 Redwood Avenue 4th Bridge Street Traffic, 4th Bridge Traffic Study. And a motion to review the porta potties in uh, Riverside Park. 
And then our next workshop is scheduled for the 29th. Uh, we're talking about caveman pool that day, as well as uh, the finalizing um, our ARPA funds, potentially reallocating some of those, um, and talking about the URA task force. And on that one today, I'm supposed to ask you all, uh, I guess, what your, what your idea is for URA task force um, to just make sure that we cover everything that we want to talk about um, at that meeting. And I guess personally, I have a concern that sometimes when we've done task forces in the past, we have gotten a few extra people on a committee to specifically look at something, but we haven't really involved the general public. And I think for me personally on the URA, I would really like to see public involvement on, um, on the URA before we just get into kind of go mode with a very specific task force. So I guess um, Aaron was wanting some direction on, on that workshop. If anybody has ideas, um, you could either talk about it now or, or just bring it up to him over the course of the next few days, but they want to be prepared for that uh, presentation. Brian. So are you suggesting for that like a URA round table? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I wasn't. I guess for me, um, you know, with some of our task forces, we have, you know, we've assigned a few people to be on a basically a subcommittee or a short-term task force, but we haven't really involved the general public. And I guess to me, I think we should take a little bit of a step back on the URA and learn about what some other communities have done with it and, and how to go about it and maybe doing more of like a big picture community. It would probably involve some forums maybe uh, more so than a round table, but um, ask ask the, a larger community what they're interested in seeing us focus on here in Grants Pass to, um, to develop the community rather than um, getting very specific about naming a few people to a task force. So, Bell. Yeah, I, I would also agree with Sarah. We did have a, um, years ago, we did have a, a forum, but it was in the very early stages of the um, urban renewal area, to just talking a little bit about what it was. And I was surprised, there was quite a few people that showed up. So I think as well that I think doing a forum that explains what a URA is, as well as talking about what other cities have done so they can kind of see visuals. I think a lot of people don't realize that we had a URA and that's what developed the parkway. Um, so to kind of bring it in and let them understand what kind of big picture it can be, I think is an important thing before we dive into a task force. So I would support the idea of doing a forum, at least one forum, before we came up with a task force. Anyway, you can provide some more feedback. I think just, um, Aaron, if you have questions about what would be helpful for, for you planning that meeting. Um, yeah, yeah, the current presentation for that workshop would be here is a list of potential members for your task force as we were discussed in council direction was let's form a task force. When we mentioned the task force and membership, council wanted to broaden that a little bit. So we had a broadened list of potential task force members. Now it seems like there may be some interest in council to not maybe form a task force right away, but maybe have more of a public outreach program associated with the purpose of urban rural agency and and the potential programs and get getting some excitement from that perspective uh, as an alternative or as a precursor to the task force and just need to let you know I, I just need to know if that's where you're wanting to go we may need to shift gears a little bit um, but if you want to form a task force and look at the membership then it's on the agenda we're prepared to have that discussion with regards to task force and task force members Rob um, yeah, I don't know if there's anyone else in the council who's been on task, force, task forces. I've been on several, and there's also one that I um, actually was pretty amazing, especially with the qualifications I had at that time, uh, but I didn't have many friends on the council in 2010 after the recall. But I was kept off one task force that didn't stop me from going to every single meeting and weighing in at every single meeting as, as a member of the public and being a very, I believe, uh, constructive and valuable member 
not member, but participant in that task force, even though I wasn't on it. So, um, and that was the, uh, the first uh, parking task force. But, um, so there's nothing that stops anyone from the public to going to task force meeting of any kind. There's typically meetings at every time at every meeting at a task force for the public to speak. And typically when they set an agenda, when a task force sets an agenda, one or maybe more of the days is to bring in the general public for ideas. It just depends on what direction the task force is going to go. So to say that a task force is ultra focused when it starts isn't necessarily true. A task force when it starts can be very broad and the members decide you know, and they listen to the public as well as to where is this going to go. So, I mean, we can go broader to start, but I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, say that creating a task force necessarily shuts it down or shuts down the possibilities. I agree. It's, it could be part know. of, it could be part of the task force's work, but not, they may, may likely not do it without that direction. But um, let's have this discussion on the 29th instead of doing it here during agenda review. Um, okay, anything, um, oh, I have one more thing, I guess, to bring up. So today we were supposed to meet with the HBA, um, HBA Home Builders Association. They had asked to have it moved to um, the May 13th workshop, so we did do that. And I guess I'm going to ask, um, we've been trying to meet with them every two months, and um, if we could do that in July instead of doing it back-to-back -back, um, May, June, um, how the council feels about that. Rick's giving a thumbs up. Well, well, I have no problem with it because it seems, I mean, since they pushed it out, it looks like they could use more time too. So they can bring up something at the May meeting if they felt it was earth shattering that we needed to get it earlier. But obviously I think one month won't make a big difference. Okay. Anything else to add to the agenda, Rob? So um, I know that uh, several councils have mentioned this uh, a few times, and I know that uh, informally I've discussed with other councilors and also uh, the mayor as to what uh, does Grants Pass need to do to potentially get in line for funding for a potential shelter or urban campground or, or whatever. We've been told that there's, you know, multi-millions of dollars that's going to be coming down from the state for these types of purposes. In the past, one of the main reasons that we um, missed out on that was apparently because the county commissioners would not declare a uh, homeless emergency and the state wouldn't even look at the city directly. Um, but I've been told that one of the first things you would need to, if the mayor or the council uh, wanted to uh, solicit the state for help, we would need some kind of plan. They're not just going to throw us money and say, yeah, we trust you to come up with something good. So we would need to have some kind of plan. Now, what I'm, what I'm thinking of when I speak about this is if we, let's just say we had X number of millions today and we were going to create an urban campground or a shelter, um, we, would, we would come up with a plan and let's say we were buying a piece of property in an industrial park somewhere, that's fine. I could see creating that plan, but having it be more as a template that could change over time. So we could present that plan to the state or the mayor or anyone else or the manager could present that plan to the state. And if the property that's on that plan in the interim gets sold or is no longer available, is taken off the market, um, at that point, we could, we could essentially substitute a different property, but at least we would have a template to show the state what we would do with X amount of money on a given piece of property. And if that given piece of property has to change later, we could do that, but at least we will have something. Because otherwise, we will never be in line for any of that money that might be coming for uh, homeless and um, urban campground and shelters. So I would like to see us... Um, uh, spend time at a workshop uh, coming up with direction for staff to come up with such a template and we could use a given a, a currently available piece of property as part of that template even though it's not funded and we can present that to the state and again if months go by and that property is gone we could just fill a different piece of property in but I want to have something some kind of plan that we have as a tool or as a lever to potentially present to 
the powers that be, so we are at least have a potential of being in line for funding that could come down. So I'd like to see that time at a workshop to, to, for us to discuss that and give direction to staff. Thanks, Rob. I um, actually have already I'm reached out to the governor's office, and I have a meeting planned next week with different local area partners to work on a plan. So at this point, um, I think I'm going to work with them instead of having the council work on it, but I'll keep you informed after we meet next week and get some more information. I really don't know what money is available from the state uh, just yet, if, if there is any money available to help with this. But I do have uh, UCAN and Mint and uh, different people lined up to meet next week. Okay, so then that's something that would be done outside the council or then, then come back to the council? Yeah, it's being done outside the council at this point. Uh, there's no ask for the council. Just okay, so when the money, if money were to come down, you would then be expecting that the money wouldn't go to the city? I, I don't know whether the there's completely? money available yet. I, I'm in no. touch with the governor's office right. waiting for more information about what, what funding revenues there might be available. I guess but, what I'm saying is it just seems really unlikely to me that the governor would then send money to, to private Oh, I agree. You know, there may people. be a council ask. There's just not anything to schedule at this time because we don't have enough information. But it is good for us all to be thinking about this because I think, um, especially in two or three months here, um, you know, we're going to have some different, different information and uh, we'll need to make some decisions. But it is being worked on. Um, Anything else? Brian? Yeah, um, last year we had a workshop and we reviewed some excess city property that could potentially be liquidated and um, the resources either used for affordable housing or taking some existing properties that the city has and um, utilize them for housing. Um, there were several properties that council um, basically you know, said that they would like to potentially take action on one way or another um, all over the place. And I don't really know where those are at right now. And I think that, you know, given that housing is a big issue and continues to be a big issue, and that's something that could help in that regard, I would like us to see some of that move forward, hopefully. Um, I think it's been about a year since we had that meeting. And, um, I want to see some action. So I don't know if that means we need to bring it to a workshop or what, but um, kind of getting an update on maybe where those uh, properties are at as far as where they were left with council last time. So yeah, we've been on those properties you've talk, been talking about. We've sold some. We have been working on the development aspect as council directed and has made some good progress. We can provide you with a council memo if you'd like on those properties and where we are. Uh, at this point, there isn't any uh, council action that's required. You've given us enough council action with regards to getting some of those properties ready for or, or partitioned out for development and or to do an RFP and see what kind of response we get from a development perspective. And we've done all that and have, have gotten some good progress done. So um, we give you a memo on it. That might be the most efficient way of doing it. Is there any council direction needed for properties in the Allen Creek area? Uh, not that I'm aware of at the moment, the Allen Creek area. Uh, of course, the majority of the Allen Creek area that's owned by the city is slated for future park development. I think if council is wanting to develop some of the Allen Creek property, then and, and maybe look at not utilizing that for park land, then we would need to have a discussion at, at a council level. Okay. Um, I'm okay with the memo for now, and then mm -hmm. after the memo, we can mm -hmm. uh, have further discussions if needed. Does that is that okay with everyone? A memo on? Uh, yeah, I would like to get that up memo as well because I do have some property I've wondered about. Okay. Anything else? All right. How about we adjourn into executive session? Belly. I move to adjourn the meeting and go into executive session. Seconded by Rick. All in favor of adjourning the workshop and moving into the executive session, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
All right, the council will now meet in executive session for the purpose of